Need your daily fix on mixed martial arts? We're going to kind of recap Bellator 155. From UFC 198. Who's who? Kind of a controversial decision. And who's not? I couldn't figure out why, and then they hit me. Well, don't you fret, because Golden State Media Concepts got, got you, you covered. covered. Get your daily dose of MMA podcasts. Everything from the UFC, Bellator Fighting Championships, Extreme Cage Fighting, and Victor Fighting Championships, and, and, and so, so much, much more. more. Join us as we talk about some of the biggest names in mixed martial arts. We've got you covered here on Golden State Media Concepts MMA Podcast. Thank you for tuning into the GSMC MMA Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Arnel Dillion, and hopefully you are doing well for yourself. You, your friends, your family, whether you live in the States or internationally, I hope you are doing fine for yourself. Everyone is safe, everyone's healthy during a major time of uncertainty. So for today's podcast here, I was going to be talking about extensively, I still am kind of, <laughs> about the recent UFC event, the UFC Fight Nights that had Cynthia Cavell versus Jessica Evil Eye. Really impressive fight. It's really eye-opening fight for Cynthia Cavill. And uh, sadly, from what I can tell from the fight, I am predicting a downturn for Jessica I. Maybe, but I'm also looking at an upscaling here for uh, Cynthia Cavill. She had a very, very impressive performance here. Uh, if you guys have not checked it out, all because Cynthia Cavill is right now, she's unranked. She's currently unranked right now in the flyweight division. But she defeated a number one ranked fighter in Jessica I. So from this fight here, she's definitely going to be moving up on the top ten rankings. Possibly fighting against somebody in the top five. As of right now, Valentina Shevchenko has pretty much defeated everyone in the flight division. So now at, now we're at the point now where we got to go push these unranked fighters to go compete against ranked fighters. It's the reason why we have Antonina Shevchenko, um, Antonina Shevchenko an unranked fighter, fighting against uh, Kaylin Chikagian. It's the same reason why we have somebody like Cynthia Cavell who is unranked fighting against the number one ranked fighter, who's not the champion, in the entire flyweight division. How is that even happening? Well, because the flyweight division isn't all that deep. I will get into detail about the UFC Fight Nights and the NL podcast, because I always like to end my episodes in a kind of fun way. I will test your overall knowledge of mixed martial arts and the UFC coming up in the latter half of this episode. One topic right now that pertains to not just mixed martial arts, but sports in the general sense, would be Black Lives Matter. Uh, I know Black Lives Matter, it's uh, it's a topic that's very political right now, but it also pertains a lot to sports, because in the, rec- in the past month, Dana White has been pretty much in the forefront as it pertains to bringing back sports. He wants sports, he, he takes pride knowing that out of any other sports organization out there in the world... He is the one and only one person who is leading the charge into bringing back sports into America. So right now it's uh, mixed martial arts and then boxing. And about a week ago, me and generally everybody else would agree with Dana White. I have seen a lot of praise uh, going towards Dana White. I myself praise Dana White in that I do respect the fact that this man, through this very harsh, critical, uncertain time is pushing forward, even with the coronavirus happening, he's pushing forward and having sporting events happen. I respect the man for being able to do that. But as of right now, though, things are starting to become a little a little complicated in the grand scheme of things as it pertains to sports coming back, specifically in America. And that's because, for those who don't know, I am a huge avid fan of basketball. I love basketball, and I love mixed martial arts. They are two very, very different sports, not as it pertains to its rules and the actual action that's happening in these events, but also in the in terms of the business model, unionization, how athletes are being treated, two very different sporting organizations, uh, the NBA and the UFC. We don't have anybody who is outspoken in any other sport out there other than, other than Dana White. You don't see, <laughs> you don't see Adam Silver from the NBA being as vocal as he is. Actually, a lot of players love Adam Silver. NBA players, former NBA players, and NBA analysts always praise Adam Silver because he's oh he's a supporter of player of player movement, of player independence, and he's always pushing the idea that players should be happy when working the NBA. 
exact opposite to Dana White, who's pretty much, look, if you want to be a fighter, then fight. If you don't want to fight, then get out of here. He's got that headstrong, like, you do not dictate what happens in this organization. I do. Me, the bookers, the people, the higher-ups, we are responsible for what's happening in our organization. Not the athletes. Athletes, Dana White himself has said this, that he doesn't like it when athletes try to be businessmen. And the reason for that is because they're trying to step step in their toes, uh, step their toes into something that should not pertain to them. This is the exact opposite towards you know the NBA player movement. Now, if you were to have Dana White manage the National Basketball Association, can you imagine him talking to the uh, to the uh, NBA Players Association? It, it would be a complete train wreck. It would be because unlike the UFC, which is which are, UFC is a star driven sport, yet their stars aren't perceived as much as big stars in the grand scheme of things in the world of sports and what i mean by that is because players like lebron james Carmelo anthony uh kobe bryant when he was active uh tim duncan chris paul these players all greatly impacted the game and that one single player can change that the dynamic of every other team in the nba there are 30 teams in the nba 30 billionaires much more millionaires if for each of these organizations here. There is a lot of money, trillions of dollars coming in and out from the National Basketball Association. And there's a reason why we got players who can make upwards of $300 million in a span of five, six years. While in the UFC, we can have the number one fighter in the UFC. Now, I, I'm not going to go into deals who the exact number one fighter is, but we can have a top tier fighter make about... Two million, three million, uh, three million a year. It's absolute insanity. And the reason why I'm talking about the National Basketball Association right now is because right now uh, players are playing a vocal part into creating the discussion of whether or not it is right to bring back sports. And the reason for that is because players like Kyrie, uh, players like Kyrie Irving, and I think I saw a number out there about like eighty percent of players were in agreement. That if you were to bring sports back to, back into the mainstream media, into America, then it would serve as a distraction from what's going on right now as it pertains to both the coronavirus, the coronavirus and Black Lives Matter. There are protests happening all around the world. I'm Filipino. I, I was born and raised in Abu Dhabi. And currently right now, in the Philippines, they're having protests. Like, like Filipino Filipinos and African Americans have little to no history in their respective timelines, but yet we've got we've got marches, we have protests, we got business shutting down, we've got uh, celebrities from the Philippines being very vocal to the topic of Black Lives Matter and police brutality. It's such an interesting time right now, and so Kyrie Irving and eighty percent of the NBA players who are involved in the NBA Players Association, who has um, some power, which would include somebody like Chris Paul. They're just saying, okay, we should not bring back sports because if you bring back sports, then the media. Guess what? If you look, if you type up news, what's the first thing you see? We're gonna see, like, like right now, I type, I type up news. I'm seeing Atlanta protests, protests happening in Atlanta, and then we got uh, shootings happening, and they all connect towards police brutality, Black Lives Matter, leftists versus rights. It's very controversial and very. It's it's on the news twenty four seven. Like, if unless you're living in Iraq, the incident that happened with George Floyd, everyone knows about it. Everyone knows the I can't breathe. Everybody has saw the video footage. It's very complicated and very distressing right now. And now we have NBA players going out there and being like, you know what? Here's the thing. They have the power to do this. Even though there are billionaires who accepted this, because um, there are 22 teams that just got accepted back into the NBA in terms of resuming the season. We have 22 billionaires, and they can be vetoed out of the season actually starting from these NBA players. Can you imagine if that would happen to the UFC? Just think about that. Let's say Dana White were to be like, you know what? We are going to have a UFC fight, uh, fight Island event happening this Saturday. And then the players have the ability to unanimously agree, no, we're not going to allow it. That would be absolute insanity. If Dane White was running the NBA somehow, 
If you were to run the NBA, he'd be like, okay, guys, like, come on. I write the, like, me and the higher ups here, we write the paychecks. You do your job. I do my job. All right. That doesn't work in the NBA. It just doesn't. And I'm talking about this now because I'm thinking, how come the UFC isn't like this when it comes towards uh, player empowerments, uh, when it comes to athlete empowerments? In the NBA, NFL, NHL, MLB, even though they're team sports, I like the camaraderie, uh, the camaraderie that camaraderie because it's a thing that people have talked about. Um, old heads have talked about as it pertains to um, modern modern sports in general, <laughs> in uh, in the sense that a lot of these athletes nowadays they're not focused on trying to be the best; they're focused on having a career, having a successful career where they can make a lot of money. And be happy doing so. I love that that's like very controversial now to think about it. Oh, dang. It's, oh man, it's in it awful that these athletes here get to get, get to be paid really high and they get to dictate and control their own careers. Oh, wow, man. Players have gotten soft nowadays. And now this got me thinking about the UFC. When will we have vocal athletes in the UFC band together? We have, we do have vocal athletes. We have John Jones, Conor McGregor, Izzo Adesanya. But they're never really united. Like right now, Chuck Liddell, Chuck Liddell, Israel Adesanya, John Jones, they're all going out there and they're being at the front lines, trying to make a positive impact in the communities, respectively. But wouldn't it be nice, though, if we get to see all like those three athletes come together in the same area and unite together? I know, like, they, every, all of them live in different parts of the world. Chuck Liddell, Huntington Beach... Is Adesanya, New Zealand, John Jones, New Mexico. They're all in different parts of the world here, but I would like to see a lot more fighters unite together, band together. There are constantly athletes, there are constantly UFC fighters, MMA fighters out there constantly complaining, hey, the UFC doesn't really care about us. We deserve to get more money. But yet, these athletes don't do anything about it, though. I am not blaming Dana White at all about this. What I'm saying that what I'm saying is, like, I, I'm kind of agree with with Dana White in that if these athletes really want change, then they should do a better job renegotiating, and that's what the uh, that's what the NBA Players Association has done, in that they pretty much barter and negotiate their way, and they do not care if they miss a year's worth of mo- a year's worth of salary, they don't. They're like, okay, you can take away my year's worth of salary, whatever. My contract is guaranteed. I make this money no matter what because we are in control. We are famous athletes. We bring the money in. Not you. Not the NBA branding. Us. LeBron James brings the brand. Chris Paul brings the brand. Allen Iverson brings the brand. Zion Williamson. Adam Silver does not bring uh, viewers into this. The, Adam Silver and whatever bill- and, and the billionaires, the 22 that are active right now trying to push for a turn in the NBA, they don't... They're not as vocal, with the exception of Mark Cuban. And even then, Mark Cuban is a supporter of player empowerments. When will the UFC ever get to this point? When will we see actual legitimate unions? I know there are unions in the world of mixed martial arts, but I'm talking about legitimate unions that uh, Dana White and the UFC have to actually acknowledge. Not just, hey, we're a band of like random fighters that are banding together here, and we just support each other. <laughs> I don't... I'm not a fan of that. I I, I really don't. These uh, these athletes here, they they put their lives on the line uh, in a very dangerous job here, and I like to see a lot more unity happening. I really do. I remember last week I was talking about uh, like Ben Askren, Chael Sonnen, Ben Askren, Chael Sonnen, Kobe Covington, uh, GSP, Anderson Silva, uh, Brock Lesnar. We have all these fighters out there that are doing the best they can in order. They're doing their best in order to help their own careers, but they never do anything in the grand scheme of things as it pertains to helping a community or helping um, or helping other players. In the NBA Players Association, eighty percent of players. Uh, I'm surprised. Like uh, the twenty percent in- includes LeBron James, and he's a very very powerful force in the um, in the grand scheme of things of the NBA and in sports in general. We don't see these types of narratives or storylines happening. In the UFC, can you imagine if like Kobe Covington, Kamaru Usman, Jorge Masvidal, they all just stopped feuding 
and they stop complaining at each other on Twitter. They join forces and like, you know what? We want to renegotiate. Not only do we want to, re- we want to renegotiate, let's have an actual discussion about the about bringing back mixed martial arts into the mainstream because it does distract media members. If sports is backed, the media will stop talking about Black Lives Matter and will all of a sudden start talking about, yeah, sports is back, yay. It's a very controversial, very difficult topic uh, topic to talk about. And I don't know where this is going. I'm pretty sure Dana White and the UFC are still going to continue pushing forward. And just like the fighters of the UFC, they're going to be like, okay, let's ignore everything else that's happening. Let's just focus on what's happening to us right now. There's nothing wrong looking out for yourself, but unity at times would be a real refreshing thing to see in the UFC. You're listening to the GSMC MMA Podcast, coming back after the short break here. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen, It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA, it's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. And we are back. So, is it ethical or unethical for the UFC to make a comeback during a time of major uncertainty with Black Lives Matters, protests, coronavirus? Is it a yay? Is it a nay? Well, for basketball, for NFL, for baseball, and from other sources, they would say it is a nay. But, I'll give credit where credit is due that if Dana White can continue putting out UFC shows that are, that, that are following guidelines, everything is safe. Ronaldo Jacare Souza, he was diagnosed with uh, coronavirus, and because of the UFC, because of Dean White, they were able to go catch it, and they're able to prevent a disaster. So they are capable of having these shows go on without creating some disaster as a predicted sickness. And well, for the whole Black Lives Matter issue and going with George Floyd, uh, why UFC isn't putting out a statement out there concerning their beliefs as it pertains to racism. And their political viewpoints. Well, Dana White, I, here's what I do. I think I genuinely believe that he and the upper echelon in the UFC, their priority right now is getting their show going on. Like, everything else that's happening in the world, all the insanity, it's just annoyances to them. I think if you hear Dana White whenever he's talking about, whenever he's asked about a question, it has happened in a press conference recently where a reporter asked Dana White, Hey, how come you and the rest of the UFC, like Upper Epsilon, or didn't put a memo out there on their viewpoint on what's going on right now in America? And Dana was like, the world is crazy. The only thing you can do right now is look forward, okay? The world is utter insanity. By the way, we're going to keep shows going on because we're not cowards. That pretty much what was um, is Dana White's mindset as it pertains to the UFC and their stance right now into its presence in the world of sports, leading the way for sports to make a comeback. Uh, compared to everything else here. Because right now the NBA, uh, the NBA is supposed to make a comeback by end of July. But currently right now, there's huge, uh, arguments going on within the Players Association. And I don't, and the NBA, here's the thing. If 80% of your talents can't play, then there is no way you can have the, uh, the NBA start. This isn't like the UFC where you can just replace the fighter with, you know, Johnny Nobody. UFC has done this where they tried, Hiring like impromptu Johnny Nobodies to go compete at these events, even though they really shouldn't be. But you can't do the same thing with the NBA. Uh, NBA, there's just too much star power. There's just too much star power there within the NBA world compared to UFC. But now let's talk about the UFC Fight Night event here. Headline with Cynthia Cavello versus Jessica Evil Eye. That fight was great. It really was. But you know what also was great? The prelims. I know, I know. Most people do not enjoy the prelims because the prelims. 
for the most part, involves fighters whose records aren't all that attractive looking. Uh, for instance, right now, when I look at the winners uh, of the prelim cards here, we have, uh, 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 oh, sorry, sorry if I butcher his name incorrectly here, but uh, Merab Devalshi, Devalshi, he had, without a doubt, the second most impressive performance of the entire night, uh, Merab here. And his record is 11-4. He's 11-4. He had, uh, I think his current record right now is 12 takedowns in a single fight, which is impressive as all heck. But you look at his record, 11-4. He faced against Gustavo Lopez, 11-5. Gina Mazzani, 6-4. Zakub Adeshev, 3-2. Tyson Nam, 17-11. Anthony Ivey, 8-3. Christian Aguilera, who had one of the more better performances of the entire night, is 14-6. And, and there was also a prelim fight that was canceled. Then involved Jordan Griffin, who's 18 and 7, uh, versus Derek Min, uh, Derek Minner, who's 24 and 11. The records right now aren't all that impressive, and considering the fact that none of these fighters are within the top 12, top 12 rankings of their own respective divisions, it's hard for someone to be excited for it unless you're a hardcore uh, MMA fan. But I say right now, if you haven't watched the prelims, I recommend you do. It's really enjoyable, and the reason why I say also, also it's very historic. I think I read somewhere. I read somewhere that this is the first time ever in UFC history to which three fights ended within one minute and through all KO. I don't know if it's very nitpicky information, but it's very interesting. Yeah. Like, throughout all of UFC history, this is the first time ever in its history that they had three uh, they had three fights that ended via first round KO in under one minute. Because uh, Christian Aguilera defeated Anthony Ivey in 59 seconds by KO. We've got Tyson Nam, who defeated his opponent by 30 seconds, and then Julia Avila, who won her who won her contest in just 22 seconds. And then we got the main event. Now the main event ended off with a unanimous decision victory, but about Marable's fight against uh, Gustavo Lopez was incredibly impressive. Was very impressive. His, like his wrestling was just on point and was exciting to watch. I know most people don't like the wrestling aspect of this, but. Marab's game is mostly prioritized around slamming people and ground and pounding than it is trying to maintain control onto the ground. So it was one of the more fun wrestling matches out there that I think a lot of people would enjoy a lot more often. And then if we go over here to the main card, we've got here. So we got uh, Maria Agapova versus Hannah Cyphers. Maria Agapova, wow, just wow. I respect both of these fighters immensely. Hannah Cyphers. She just fought last week. She fought... Was that a week or a week and a half ago? She, wa- she fought a week and a half ago against Mackenzie Dern. And Cyphers was doing really well for herself against Mackenzie Dern. Mackenzie Dern being one of the top women prospects of all the UFC divisions. And then we have Maria Ogopova, another top prospect, fighting against Hannah Cyphers. And I find it... You know what's very amusing to me about Hannah Cyphers? Hannah Cyphers looks like she doesn't enjoy her job. She just doesn't. She looks like she's just doing this for the salary. She doesn't even look like she's amped. It's like, yeah, I'm gonna fight. Yeah. She had proper lose face. If you're a, uh, if you watch a lot of sports and you get to see, like, you can tell who's gonna win the fight before the fight even starts. It's kind of like basketball where, you know, you got your squad, you got another squad, and you gotta go and pick out, you know, that one last member in your team to go play 5v5 or 4v4. And you know, just by looking at the person, you're like, yeah, this person just doesn't have it. I'm going with that with Hannah Cyphers. She pretty much placed herself, even though she's slightly older than Maria Agapova, and she's she's about the same age as Mackenzie Dern. Hannah Cyphers already kind of placed her role as the journeyman, and throughout this entire this the fight build up here was centered around Maria Agapova. Hannah Cyphers here had about five days notice. She had five days notice, and she's fighting one weight class above her actual division. So I give props for Hannah Cyphers for going out there and fighting against somebody who is as game as Agapova. Agapova, I think she's 22 years old. She's about 22, 23 years old. She's long. I can't tell if it's just Hannah Cyphers, uh, Hannah Cyphers being a strawweight competing at the flight division, but Agapova is a long, very big fighter, and her striking is impressive. Wow. Her uh, um, look at Hannah Cyphers versus, uh, versus Agapova. Cyphers had no answer. The only, the one thing Cyphers did well was the clinching, which I do commend her for. But it's this very similar scenario 
went to when Hannah Cyphers fought against Mackenzie Dern. And that Cyphers, she knows the right opportunity of when to clinch and when to put out shots. I just don't think she has enough power in her shots to make her seem credible enough to be threatening for her opponent, for opposing opponents, to think to take it all that seriously and they can battle through it. Because Hannah Cyphers, she clinches with Agapova. Agapova is taking these shots, but she's just taking it. She's eating all these shots, kind of like Mackenzie Dern. And then Cyphers gave Agapova enough time to recover through these uh, through these clinch strikes that Agapova was able to get out and just outbox Cyphers. And then at the very end here, Agapova ended up going with the leg kick onto Cyphers and then started doing some ground pound onto the cage. And it was a dominant performance here. By Maria Agapova. Uh, it was impressive as all heck. I recommend everyone to go watch it. Agapova, she's a real threat in the flight division. Even though she's a prospect right now, I can expect her coming into the top 10 in the rankings. Yeah, th- if she wins one more time against somebody um, just outside the top 10, she'll easily be sliding in herself into the top 10 rankings. And here's the thing. Because of the fact that she's young, and there is her boxing is really good, uh, but her uh, her grappling leaves a lot to be left desired. So I say Agapova might be competing in the top five rankings in the span of two and a half years. I say two and a half years. And she's only about 22, 23 years old. So she has a lot of time to develop. We got Jordan Espinosa versus um, uh, Mark De La Rosa. Could have gone either way. So we have Andre Feely and Jordan Espinosa winning both of their fights against Charles Jourdain. And Mark De La Rosa, these fights really could have gone either way. They really could have. Uh, I, I don't really know what to say about those fights because they're very similar. Uh, they're very, um, that was in the featherweight and the bantamweight division here. Charles Rosa versus Ke- uh, Kevin Aguilar. This might be the fight. It's up there for Fire the Night. <laughs> That's all I can say. Uh, it's up there with Fire the Night. And then Carl Robertson versus uh, Marvin Vittori. This was a star making performance by Vittori. Uh, I, have to say, I have to say, Carl Robertson. Was looking really good for himself. It was a real back and forth action here, uh, especially for Carl Robertson early on, into or early on into the first round. But by, by the second ladder of the first round, Martin Vittori kind of picked up like a second wind as Carl Robertson's cardio was a wee bit going down because there were moments there where Carl Robertson was kind of gassing himself. Um, he was trying, he was trying to go for the knockout or trying to dominate Vittori. Vittori was able to pretty much like handle all the all the damages, all the punches, and all the kicks being taken in, and he was able to recover through it. Got a second win in the second half of the first round, and got himself a submission victory. So I am very impressed with Mark and Vittori there. And then we have the main event of Jessica Evil Eye versus Cynthia Caveo. All right, I said about this before the commercial break, in that the women's flight rankings right now don't actually make all that sense. Not only do they not make all that much sense, the rankings, uh, they don't... Here's the thing, so... Jessica I, number one ranked fighter. Number one ranked fighter, the only other fighter ahead of her is the current flyer champion, Valentin Shoshenko. And so why is she fighting against Cynthia Cavello? The same answer the same answer for that question would be why was Antony Shoshenko fighting against uh Kaylin Chikagian? There's no re- there's no reason for Antonina to fight somebody as top tier as Chikagian. It doesn't make no sense for Cavallo to fight against Jessica I. The reasonable booking, through logic, would say Jessica I versus Killing Trakagian. Whoever wins that fight gets to... Whoever wins that fight might fight against Valentina or fight against Yuan Calderwood later on. But that didn't happen. So unlike Antina Shevchenko, who was an unranked fighter trying to, um, trying to get inside into the top five rankings, Cindy Cavallo had the best performance of the entire night. She's up there. It's uh, yeah, it's up there and Marab who had the two best performances of the entire night here. And so in the first round, it was a back and forth action here between Cynthia Cavello and Jessica I. Jessica's eye is significantly a lot more larger, much more bigger than Cynthia. And this guy was able to go pick apart. Uh, um, no, this guy was able to pick apart Cynthia throughout most of the first round here, but not all that much. I think she had about th- plus three in terms of significant striking. So Jessica I won first round without a doubt. You can't argue. You can't argue against that. And then we go towards the second round, third round, fourth round, fifth round. All Cynthia, all time. It, 
this guy pretty much gassed herself out in the first round. And then when she went to the second round, Cynthia just turned this thing into a complete wrestling match. She turned it into a wrestling match, and then she grappled and tired of Jessica I. And by the time I was able to stand up from the grappling, she was too exhausted to go and match up with Cynthia's uh, boxing ability. The fight started off with Cynthia Caveo versus Jessica I, the grappler versus the striker. And then after the first round, the grappler ended up being the striker. And then Cynthia Caveo started pretty much defeating this guy in every aspect of the fight game. Every aspect. Cynthia Caveo had the better clinch. She out-wrestled Jessica I. And her boxing was much, much more impressive in four out of the five rounds here. Jessica I, she had one really good round. First round. But beyond that, though, Cynthia Caveo, her boxing, especially in the fifth and third round, was just on points. I think in the third round, this guy had about less than 10. She had about less than 10 in significant strikes compared to Cynthia Caveo, who in that one round was able to get like 23. So I am impressed by Cynthia Caveo. This guy did attempt multiple submission holds several times, and she did try to defend at some moments here. But even when uh, this guy was trying to go mount a comeback through some submission attempts, and Cynthia Caveo was just too much against this guy. So now I'm happy again. I'm, ha- I'm happy for, Cynthia, for Cynthia. She showed a complete dominant game against the number one ranked fighter in the women's fight division. I can only expect Cynthia Caveo to be within the top five rankings. If I were to book this right now, knowing now that Cynthia defeated Jessica I, I would say Cynthia should match up against Chukagian. That is if the UFC brass are not confident enough in Chukagian to go challenge against Valentina again. If Valentina were to defeat Yohan Calderwood. And so you're listening to the GSMC MMA Podcast. Come back after the short break here, to which I'll be discussing the rankings here. What are the implications of this card and the next upcoming card? See you soon. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. And we are back. So I discussed UFC Fight Night with Cynthia Cabello versus Kai. So what's going to happen in the fight division? Well, let's look at it. Uh, current champion Valentin Zhenko. It's rumored that she's going to be facing off against Yuan Calderwood. That's the next potential matchup you can see for Valentina. But as of right now, Valentin Zhenko is currently unavailable as she's rehabbing through an injury. And also, she's also promoting a movie. Kaylin Chukagian, she just had a recent fight against Antina Shochenko right now. So she's currently unavailable. Cynthia Cavallo, she was an unranked fighter, unranked, and now she bumped herself up to being the number three ranked fighter in the women's fight division. Amazing. So now, my guess will be Kaylin Chikagian versus Cynthia Cavallo, winner of that matchup, my fight against Yuan Calderwood or Valentin Shoshenko. So, um, a great hair for uh, Cynthia Cavallo. Chikagian versus Cavallo, they are... They are perfect for one another in terms of their fighting style. Only issue, though, is the fact that Cynthia Cavallo, she's she should be competing at strawweight, but instead she's fighting at flyweight. That's my big issue with Cavallo. She is fighting one div- If Cavallo was in the women's strike division, she would wreck and dominate people. So, but Cavallo, she's doing this at the flyweight division right now. And Cavallo looks still pretty young also. So, 
Chukagian versus Caveo. I'm going to put my money on Chukagian defeating Caveo off the bases. Off the, I'm a person who believes that size really does matter in the matchups. Now, size didn't help Caveo at all. I mean, I mean, size didn't help Jessica I out when she got out wrestled by Cynthia Caveo. Incredibly important, uh, impressed, uh, impressed by that performance. But Chukagian versus Caveo. Both these fighters can grapple. Both these fighters are really good strikers. But because, but unlike Jessica I, Chikagian's grappling is on a whole other level. So if Caveo, and Caveo's biggest strength is wrestling, then secondary would be striking. And if these two were to have a wrestling match, I would put money on Chikagian. And because I believe Chikagian would beat uh, Cynthia in a wrestling, gra- in, in a grappling exchange, I think that nullifies uh, Cynthia's grappling ability and it gives Chukagian uh, more. Chukagian is more of a di- is more of a dynamic fighter and is more complicated to go and solve than just Sky. So I say Chukagian is going to win the matchup there. When these two do get matched up, and if these two get matched up, we have Jennifer Maya versus uh, Vivian Arahu. Uh, this is a tough one. I got to go for. Vivian is Vivian makes sense to me. No, they both they both make sense. Who would win between Jennifer Maya and Vivian Arujo? So Maya right now is ranked number four, while Vivian's ranked number nine. Vivian just lost to Jessica I. But um, Maya lost to Kaylin Chukagan in a in a very one sided fight, in my opinion. So I have to go for I, it's a complete toss up. I don't know who would actually win between Maya and Vivian. Also, another fight we got here coming up would be Roxanne McDaffrey against Lauren Murphy. Roxanne McDaffrey, she's number five rank. It's very astounding to know that, considering that uh, Roxanne McDaffrey was at one point, oh, this time last year, was an unranked fighter. And she's she's only three and four in the FC, but she's somehow number five, number five ranked. And that's because she's had like impressive victories over Anthony Sochenko and Macy Barber. Uh, she came into those fights as the underdog. And that's why Roxanne got bumped herself up into the fifth, into the number five rankings here. So we got Lauren Murphy against Roxanne McDurphy. I say Murphy is my prediction to win this. Off the basis that Murphy is coming off um, to a, a very impressive um, victory over against Andrea Lee. I predict Andrea Lee would go defeat her, but it didn't, it didn't work out. And then she defeated a very game uh, Mara Mara Barella by TKO. And when I look at her performances in those fights compared to McDurphy's performance against Maya... Antony Shuchenko, upon defeating Antony Shuchenko, it was considered impressive, but not anymore. And then her win against Macy Barber. I say in terms of impress- more who has had the better string of three fights, like whose three fight performances were much better, I have to go for Lord Murphy. And I say Lord Murphy is going to go overtake Roxanne McDaffrey in the rankings. Who would I personally want to win? I would love to, I would love to have Mad- uh, McDaffrey win. As a human being, she is an angel. But... In this matchup here, I don't think she will win. I don't. And then we got Courtney Casey against Jillian Robertson. Oof. So Jillian Robertson just lost to Macy Barber, but she defeated against Sarah Frota, which is a good matchup for her. Uh, Courtney Casey, she defeated um, Brella by submission, and then she also defeated Angela Hill. Whatever your opinion is on Angela Hill in terms of her record, her record doesn't show it, but Angela Hill is a game fighter, and she can take on anybody in the top rankings of the other of the division. So, and Courtney Casey also lost against Cynthia uh, Caveo, which is nothing to um, you know nothing to look on uh, look wrong about. So I say Courtney Casey is going to go and win that matchup there. We got Molly McCann. She's prepped up against Talia Santos. I'm not really sure of either fighter's um, stats right now, but Molly McCann is coming into this fight with a three-fight win streak. And uh, Tali Santos... Oops, I'm right now looking for Talia's thing. Talia Santos is right now 0-1. and one. She's 0-1. and one. Uh, She lost against Mara Mara Brala, and she's nowhere near the rankings in the women's fight division. Paige Van Zandt. She's facing against Amanda Ribas. Amanda Ribas is going to defeat Paige Van Zandt. Because Paige Van Zandt has been going through a series of injuries, and I place injuries and being away from the fight game uh, really up there as for reasons why you should not win a fight. Also, she's like 5-3 and three in her last couple fights, so Paige Van Zandt is like one of the more popular fighters out there who can main event a card, contrary to what her actual record is. And also, Paige Van Zandt, if you listen to her interviews, is more focused on renegotiating her contract than she is about going up into the rankings. 
So, Paige Van Zandt, I understand Paige Van Zandt's incentive to wanting to go win against uh, Amanda Ribas so that, that it helps her chances of renegotiating and making more money in a future contract. But at this point, though, uh, because Van Zandt has been gone from the fight game and Amanda Ribas has been pretty pretty consistent uh, in the UFC, I have to go with Ribas. I got to choose consistency and activity versus somebody who is a, who is a good prospect but hasn't showed anything in a while. And then we have Ji Young Kim versus Alexa Grasso coming up next week at the UFC Fight Night. Dustin Poirier versus Dan Hooker. Uh, this is going to be a fun fight. I am really impressed by Ji Young Kim. The only issue with her is her ability to make weight. She's a really small flyweight, but she's somehow coming into the fight overweight than she actually should be. I don't get it. If you look at Ji Young Kim, she looks like she should be competing at the women's stride division. She should be slightly bigger. Then the rest of the fighters who compete at the women's strike division. But she's competing at the women's flight division. And she was a former bantamweight champion at Gladiator. So what's going on here? I, I don't understand Ji Young Kim. She doesn't look like her actual weight. But yet she's struggling making... She's struggling... Trying, she looks small. I was saying, she looks way too small to compete in the bantamweight division. But bantamweight is her natural weight. But she also looks too small to go compete at the flight division. Uh, it, it, it gets really frustrating because uh, Ji Young Kim, she's had two cash weight fights recently. And it's because she failed to go make weight. She came in at 128 and at 130 coming into the flight division fight, her past two flight division fights. She defeated against Nadia Kasim. Good for her, but she lost 20% of her fight purse. She lost to Antina Shevchenko. And Anthony Shevchenko right now, her credibility is kind of in a downturn. And Ji Young Kim, she lost a percentage of her money in that fight as well. So no matter what the performance is for Ji Young Kim against Alex Grasso, Ji Young Kim just cannot ex- she cannot excel within this division until she actually gets the weight cut going down. And weight cutting, Daniel Kumi talked about this, where he feels like weight cutting now more than ever should be at its hardest. And the reason for that is because the fact that a lot of these fighters, they don't own a gym. <laughs> or They don't own a gym or they don't have their own private gym. They work out from their own home gym. They work out from their own home gym. And because of that, they don't have access to like, like steam rooms. They don't have access to like saunas. They lose, being able to lose weight right now without access to that is very difficult. And so with the Ji Young Kim, who had access to the saunas and, and to the steam room, she struggled making weights. And so now she's coming into this fight against Alexa Grasso. And here's how I view it. If Jeon Kim cannot make weight for this fight, she has to compete in the bantamweight division. She has to. She has to be forced to compete in the bantamweight division. Because right now, it's a complete waste of time. It's a waste of time for a fighter to go and not make weight. Because if you, if they win the fight, it doesn't actually really count because it's a cash weight fight. Also, that fighter who didn't make weight ends up losing a percentage of their money. And a lot and these MMA fighters, they don't make that much money. Mixed martial artists in the grand scheme of things don't make that much money unless you are incredibly active. Like Hannah Cyphers made a lot of money because she competed in two fights in a span of two weeks. But that's not the smartest thing to do. It really isn't. Especially for a fighter like Jeon Kim who's only about 30 years old. And if Jeon Kim were to miss weights and defeat Alexa Grasso, Kim's, um, uh, uh, Kim's rankings doesn't all that doesn't change. Alexa Grasso's ranking doesn't change. Kim loses money. Alexa Grasso doesn't make all that much money because Kim lost some weight. It's just frustrating from both sides. And I genuinely hope that Kim does is able to go and make the weight so all parties are happy. And I can finally look at her fights and not be disappointed when it turns out she did make the rank the, uh, the, the weight. And now I'm watching a fight that doesn't matter all that much. And so with Marvin Vittori's impressive victory in the co-main event, what is that landing him in the rankings? He's right now about ranked number 17. He's got no fights coming up uh, soon. Uh, is he going to be fighting against somebody in the top 10 rankings? I don't know. If Vittori really wants to make his way up the rankings, he should go and challenge someone like Uriah Hall, who at one point was part of the top 10 in rankings. And is a very big name fighter within the rankings here. We have Anderson Silva. We don't know what his status is right now in the UFC. We have Edmund Shabazian against Derek Brunson coming up in three months. And we have Ke- the returning Kelvin Gastelum against Jack Hermason. Wow, that's going to be a really fun fight to watch. And those are the major fights coming up in the UFC middleweight rankings here. 
currently right now, Robert Whitaker, Izzo Adesanya, Paulo Costa, Yoromero, Darren Till, all the big name fighters who compete in the middleweight rankings, we don't know what their status is, what their status is right now. Izzo Adesanya is busy. Do- it's also because they're all international fighters here. None of them reside in the states here. The highest ranked fighter who currently resides in the states in the states is Kevin Gastelum, and Kevin Gastelum is fighting against Jack Hermerson, who and Kevin Gastelum, even though he was ranked number one at one point and number two. He right now is ranked number six. So if you look at the top five rankings here, we have Israel Desanya, Robert Whitaker, Paula Costa, Yoromero, Darren Till. Darren Till, if you've been checking up his Instagram, he doesn't seem worried at all about competing uh, competing soon. He is fine, chilling, and relaxing at home. Paula Costa, he's going through this weird complication, complication right now with the UFC brass as it pertains to one of his fight doctors. Yoromero, Romero, I don't know what his status is. He's um, He's stuck in Cuba right now. And currently right now, as a result of the coronavirus pandemic, international flights uh, flights are kind of a weird, uh, are, are in a weird, ta- uh, weird tail end. Robert Whitaker and Izzo Adesanya, they're dealing with their issues right now in Australia and in New Zealand. Izzo Adesanya actively right now is currently participating in marches and is doing speeches. I'm really happy for Izzo Adesanya for doing that. But in terms of the UFC, what's going to be happening to them? What are their ma- What what can we see next? It should be Paula Costa versus Adesanya. But then coronavirus... Uh, Black Lives Matters protests what, how, that's happening right now. Things are very complicated within the top five rankings for the UFC middleweight division. What could potentially happen, potentially, is the fact that since we know some fights that are going to be happening at the UFC Fight Island events happening in Abu Dhabi, my home nation, we don't know all the fight cards. We know there's going to be four fight cards happening. We know what's going to be happening in the first fight card. But we don't know what's going to be happening in the other three fight cards. And this fight island is specifically made to go and support fighters who live internationally and can't travel to the States. So since we have five, uh, five fighters here who don't live in the States right now, we could see any of these fighters uh, be matched up with each other. What would I like to see? I personally would like to see... Hmm. So the obvious choice here is Paula Costa versus Izzo Dosanya. Robert Whitaker should not fight against Yo Romero. The fun matchup here would be Darren Till versus Robert Whitaker. So if I were to book this right now for Fight Island, I'll say Adesanya versus Paulo Costa, Robert Whitaker versus Darren Till, and then Yo Romero is going to fight somebody outside of the rankings here. Because Yo Romero, after his performance against Izzo Adesanya, really needs to work his way back up in the division. So it's either he waits and fights against somebody like Jack Hermeson or Kevin Gastelum if they're up for it, but as of right now, the status for some of these fighters, like Yo Romero and Anderson Silva, we don't know what to expect from them. Uh, to be honest with you, Anderson Silva, I'm hearing rumors out there that Silva's contract is just going to be played out. He's not going to stay in the rankings uh, anytime soon. And I'm really sad I'm really sad about that. But you know what? In the fight business, age always wins. Father time is undefeated. And so if, it, if the UFC brass feels like Anderson Silva should be gone from the UFC as a result of his age and his current status right now in the UFC... Then I don't blame them. I really don't. You're listening to the GSMC MMA Podcast. And coming back right after the short break here, I'll test your knowledge of the fight game here with some mixed martial arts trivia. See you soon after the short break. Want to know the latest in soccer? Then listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. From MLS, the World Cup, and the Premier League. We've got you covered. The latest updates, the hottest matches, and news on the league's top players. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. David Beckham scores the goal to take England all the way to the World Cup Finals. Listen now. And we are back. So there are many different types of fans out there. We get the hardcore fans, we get the casual fans, we get the middle ground fans here. But what type of fan are you? How knowledgeable are you of the world of mixed martial arts? And specifically, how knowledgeable are you of the UFC and its history? I'm going to be a little bit honest with you. I have the tendency of bragging a lot to my friends as it pertains to the history of the UFC and MMA. So I'm going to go take this quiz right here. It is coming in from Diorama. And it's spelled with the Rama in the end being MMA. So it's DiroMMA.com. And it's got a quiz for you guys here. And if you guys want to play at home, go try it out. But I'm going to ask you a series of questions, multiple choice. And let's see how knowledgeable you are 
of the world of mixed martial arts, and also I'll go into detail about the information here. First question, who won UFC 1, the first ever UFC event? Is it Ken Shamrock, Hoist Gracie, Conor McGregor, or Dan the B. Severn? Once again, who won UFC 1, Ken Shamrock, Hoist Gracie, Conor McGregor, or Dan Severn? The answer here is Hoist Gracie. It was a one-night tournament for as much as I would I would want to see one night tournaments against come back in the UFC, but that's never going to happen. You're never going to see one fighter fight three times in one night. We have a fight right now in Gilbert Burns, who will be fighting five times in the span of nine months, which is absolute insanity that he's able to do that. No, no that, that was absolute insanity. But back then, there were fighters like Hoist Gracie and even fighters like um, Jeremy Horn who would do these long tournaments and that, and even Dan Severn. It's the explanation, like, if you look at Dan Severn and Jeremy Horn's records, it's absolute insanity. It's like 100 wins, 17 losses in the span of 10 years. It's absolute insanity. If you haven't checked up Jeremy Horn or Dan Severn's records in mixed martial arts, look at, uh, look, look them up and you'll be like, what the heck? How's it even possible? Because no one, no one in the UFC can replicate that. And no one can replicate Hoist Gracie's success at UFC 1. Who is a champion with more title defenses? So once again, so it's, is it George St. Pierre, Anderson Silva, John Jones, or Demetrius Johnson? Who is the champion with more title defenses? St. Pierre, Anderson Silva, John Jones, or Demetrius Johnson? With the most title defenses, currently the record... Going to Demetrius Johnson with 11. Absolute insanity here. Next question. Which champion held the title for the longest time? Note this difference for, this is different from Demetrius Johnson's question. So Demetrius Johnson's question was, who is the champion with the most title defenses? This one is, which champion held the title for the longest time? Is it also Demetrius Johnson? Is it Anderson Silva? George St. Pierre? Or Jose Aldo? Which champion held the title for the longest time? Now, Jose Aldo held the longest time for the Feather Division. GSP held the title the longest time in the Walter Division. Demi Johnson, the flyweight, uh, flyweight king, greatest flyweight of all time. Arguably him or Henry Sudo. Anderson Silva, great, the GOAT for the Middleweight Division. So we got here <laughs> four GOATs. But the answer here is Anderson Silva. Anderson Silva held his Middleweight title longer than... Then Demetrius Johnson's flyweight title reign, longer than GSP's uh, welterweight title reign, and longer than Josie Aldo's featherweight title reign. Who has been the youngest UFC champion? Josie Aldo, Josh Barnett, Conor McGregor, or John Jones? Now, you're probably thinking about two fighters here. Josh Barnett or John Jones. At the time... Josh Barnett was the longest reigning, was, was the youngest champion ever in UFC history at the time. But now, it's John Jones. Who has been the oldest UFC champion? Chuck Liddell, Randy Couture, Daniel Cormier, or Mark Coleman? Once again, who has been the oldest UFC champion? The answer here is Randy Couture, who came out of retirement and he won the belt on his first night back against Tim Sylvia. Impressive. Who, ha- who has more of the night bonuses? Question again. again. Who, ha- who here has more of the night bonuses? Don Cerrone, Nate Diaz, Charles Oliveira, or Joe Lozon? All four of these fighters have won multiple awards. In the FC, none of them being an actual title. The answer is Cowboy Donald Cerrone. And now, who has more fights of the night bonuses? Is it Donald Cerrone, Nate Diaz, Diego Sanchez, or Anderson Silva? Fight of the night bonuses. Now, I do know Anderson Silva has that knockout of the night bonuses. His one and only fight of the night bonus came against his fight against Shale Sonnen. No, he had two of them. He had a fight against Shil Sonnen and a fight against him against Israel Adesanya. Diego Sanchez has had his has had his share. Cerrone Diaz. 
Well, the answer here is Nate Diaz. And now here's a distinction here. So Don Cerrone has had more of the night bonuses in that he's had more performance of the night, knockout of the night, and submission of the night bonuses over Nate Diaz in the grand scheme of things. But Nate Diaz has had more fights of the night bonuses over Don Cerrone. And now, which fighter here has spent the most time in the octagon? Who is the Iron Man of the octagon amongst these fighters? We have Jeremy Stevens, Frankie Edgar, Diego Sanchez, or Damian Maya. If you guys remember, peak champion Frankie Edgar was a proper Iron Man. Every fight he went to was a firebrand scrapyard bout. And so, the answer goes to Frankie Edgar, most time spent in the octagon. Next question, who has headlined more UFC pay-per-view events? John Jones, Tito Ortiz, Anderson Silva, or Randy Couture? Once again, who has headlined more UFC pay-per-view events? John Jones, Tito Ortiz, Anderson Silva, or Randy Couture? Well, the answer is Randy Couture, most headlined UFC pay-per-view events, and that's just pure out of attrition. Uh, I can expect a fighter like John Jones getting up to that point, but right now, the record goes to Rene Couture. And now, amongst these fighters here, who has the longest winning streak? Anderson Silva, George St. Pierre, John Jones, or Demetrius Johnson? Now, this is sort of a, as a trick question here, and that I've asked before on which champion here had the longest championship reign. I've asked which fighter here has had the most title defenses. But now I'm asking, who has the longest winning streak in the UFC? Anderson Silva, George St. Pierre, John Jones, or Demetrius Johnson? The answer here is Anderson Silva. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, wait a minute. In the previous question, the question was, who here had the long, had the most title defenses? And the answer was Demetrius Johnson by a landslide. But here's the thing with these four fighters. Which of these fighters already had a long winning streak coming in before he became champion? And that was Anderson Silva. Anderson Silva was already going through a big winning streak prior to becoming champion. So his championship reign in terms of title defenses was shorter than Demetrius Johnson. But Demetrius Johnson, his winning streak prior to getting the belt was shorter than Anderson Silva when he got his strap. And because of that, Anderson Silva had the longest winning streak coming in as a champion compared to George St. Pierre, John Jones, and Demetrius Johnson. So, how well did you do in the quiz here? Well, I got something for you. If you got 0 to 3 correct answers, we are sorry. Perhaps you are not exactly a fanboy, but you should probably learn a little bit more of UFC history. If you got 4 to 6 correct answers, you know more than the average casual UFC fan. Hooray! If you got 7 to 9 correct answers, you made it. You are close to becoming an expert. Now, if you got all the questions correct, congratulations, you are a true hardcore fan. And Hoist Gracie be proud of you. I don't know if I like to have Hoist Gracie be proud of me. Now, when I first took this quiz, I got about 7 correct. So now I, I, I am qualified to be a UFC expert, but not qualified enough for Hoist Gracie to be proud of me. So I'm a little bit upset about that, but then again, I don't think I need Hoist Gracie to be proud of me, of my knowledge of the UFC. Well, I hope you enjoyed that quiz there, as I'm going to blitz through a couple of quick news here about the UFC in the world of MMA. In that former presidential candidate, Andrew Yang says UFC is exploiting its fighters. This is coming in from Yahoo. Yes and no when it comes to Andrew Yang saying that UFC are exploiting their athletes. I say that the UFC brass are outsmarting their athletes. And if the athletes themselves don't want to be taken advantage of, which I kind of believe they kind of are, and that they should be paid higher. But Dana White says, well, they signed the contract. This is what they believe their value is. If they believe their value is something else, then they should bring it up during renegotiations. So I am kind of in agreement with, uh, with Andrew Yang, and I'm kind of agreeing with Dana White here. If I would love to see Dana White and Andrew Yang sit right next to each other and they have an argument about this, I would, they would have two very, very different viewpoints. I know Andrew Yang is more left liberal while Dana White is more conservative. 
Maybe one reason why the fighters can't be paid all that well is because it is being reported in by BloodyElbow.com that in reality, UFC is increasing debts even as they continue to generate cash flow. Moody and SNP are reporting that the UFC is seeking an additional $150 million add-on to their current $2.3 billion loan. Moody's Investor Service and S&P Global Ratings both reported last week that UFC Holding LLC was looking to add on another $150 million to their current first lien term loan. The net proceeds to this add uh, on would be used to pay off their outstanding revolver balance. The add on would increase their current term loan to approximately $2.45 billion, while also upsizing the revolver from $162.75 to $212.75 million. Moody gave the loan due to 26, and B2 rating judged it as being speculative and a high credit risk. While Moody's warns uh, the UFC's high debts to um, a beta ratio, also known as leverage, levels will increase this year as cash flow from operations will decrease as long as the pandemic impacts the ability to hold live events with spectators in attendance. It also notes the UFC contracted deal shields them from some of the risks. UFC benefits from its long-term media and pay-per-view rights agreements with ESPN, which provides for a substantial portion of total revenue and EBITDA. This contractual agreement will limit the impact of the pandemic as long as events can be held, even if there will be no fans in attendance. So that's also one reason why the UFC can go and push shows happening. They don't care about gate attendance or pay-per-view buys. They don't. Their deal with ESPN pretty much puts them, gives them a safety net, and then they can get away with doing some things that other organizations can't do. There's another article here by BloodyElbow.com that Joe Rogan says on fighter payloads, probably less money because there is no live gates. The longtime voice of the broadcast team agrees it's the lack of ticket sales that are leading to fighter complaints. He says right now, this is coming in from the Jerry podcast, right now in particular there is probably less money because there is no live gates and there's an extreme amount of money, but there's also fighters that agree to certain deals. They agree to like an eight fight deal at X amount per fights. I'm putting this out there right now. That's a bad deal. It really is. These fighters should pay for four fight up uh, for a four or five fight fight uh, contract because eight fight con- you could finish a contract in the span of years. It will take years to finish off the contract, considering the fact that some of these fighters compete only once a year. We got champions who fight once a year, sometimes once every two years. It has happened in the past. So why are these champions and fighters agreeing to these long-term deals? It's ridiculous. It really is. So he says they agreed to like an eight-fight deal to X amount per fight, and then they become more popular and they want to renegotiate their deal, and the UFC's like, look... We're just trying to stay open. We're not going to renegotiate anything. You can take it or you can leave it, but it's what it is. I think it's a matter of that. I agree with Joe Rogan, and I also agree with Dana White's stance here, in that these fighters are signing contracts, and they have no one to blame but themselves. Dana White has said in the past, like, he doesn't like it when UFC fighters try to act like businessmen, because the truth is they really don't know the fight game, and they're not that good at negotiating. I think it's not right for Jorge Masvidal and John Jones to go say, hey, we deserve more money, when just one year ago, they signed a new contract. <laughs> like, you heard the term, no, takes his backsies? Yeah, you just can't do that. You just can't be like, oh, I all of a sudden just want more money. It doesn't matter if you genuinely believe you deserve X amount of money, then you had to negotiate. Yeah, there's a lot of forward planning in advance as it pertains to fighter contracts. When you look at the NBA, these athletes plan out five years in advance of what they're going to do. you got athletes planning out seven years in advance into their careers. There's a lot of forward planning that goes on for NBA athletes, and it's because they have a union, and players are constantly interacting with each other and talking over what their contracts are. Compared to the UFC, I don't think there are that many fighters who are openly negotiating with each other and openly expressing their viewpoints as it pertains to how much money each other fighter makes in a per-fight basis. These fighters need to do better in being negotiators instead of blabbing their mouth on Twitter and complaining. That's how I view it. And that brings us close to today's podcast here. I gotta say thank you for tuning into the GSMC MMA Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'd like to ask that you please remember to subscribe to the show and write a nice review. That really helps us. Also, you can please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you, and have a good night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts MMA Podcast. 
part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.